The History of the Paris Commune by Prosper Oliver Lisa Gare. Okay, so I've done a few videos now on the Paris Commune, and if you've already seen those, bear with me. Uh, for the purposes of making this video independent, I'm, I'm just going to kind of recap the same things I always say. First of all, apologies in advance. I am going to mispronounce all the French names in here. I, I never learned French, um, which is ironic. As I, no, ironic is the wrong word. Unfortunate, um, because I'm interested in French history. So uh, it makes it difficult for me to talk about the histories I've read because I don't know how to pronounce the names. But uh, bear with me, I'll mangle the names, I'm sure. But uh, I, sorry. Uh, secondly, yeah. Um, what is the Paris Commune? So the Paris Commune was a working class uprising in Paris in 1871 in which kind of the radicals gained control of Paris for two months uh, and even held elections and set up a provisional government before they were kind of crushed by the larger French army and then the the normal law and order and bourgeois uh, regime was reestablished. The exact ideological makeup of the Paris Commune uh, has been debated a lot. Um, it has been closely associated in the popular mind with Karl Marx, although if you actually look at the ideology of the government that made up the Paris Commune, uh, the majority of them were Jacobins, uh, meaning they, they kind of identified with the Jacobins of the 1793 revolution. Uh, there was a minority of socialists in the Paris Commune, um, but even then very few of them were Marxist. Uh, they were more kind of uh, the pro... I'm going to mispronounce this name again. Prodine, Prodon, the, the French anarchist socialist Prodon. Uh, they were more of that school. Nevertheless, uh, Karl Marx wrote extensively about the Paris Commune, and the Paris Commune at the time and then since then was closely associated with Karl Marx. And so the legacy of the Karl Marx and the legacy of the Paris Commune are closely mixed together. Now, this particular book, um, the History of the Paris Commune by Prosper Oliver Lissagare is kind of like the official Marxist, his, Marxist his, history of the Paris Commune. So the author, Lissagare, participated in the commun Paris Commune and he fought on the barricades. Although in his own words, he was neither member nor official nor functionary of the Commune. So, yeah, we talk about the Paris Commune in terms of, like, the people who fought on the barricades, but then there also was the Paris Commune, the provisional government that was set up. Elisa Gare had no part of the government of the Paris Commune, but he was on the barricades. Now, after the fall of the Commune, uh, there was a m big massacre, which Elisa Gare somehow managed to escape. He was one of the lucky ones. And he made it to exile in England, where he spent the next six years writing his history of the Paris Commune. During that time, he also became part of Karl Marx's inner circle. Uh, and in fact, the English edition of the history of the Paris Commune, because Lisa Gare originally wrote it in French, but it was translated into English by Karl Marx's daughter. Eleanor Marx, and so the version re we read in English uh, was actually translated by Karl Marx's own daughter. And then Marx's, Karl Marx himself expanded it and corrected some of the sections, uh, some of the analysis in the English edition. So Karl Marx's fingerprints are all over this. Although interestingly, interestingly enough, if you read a biography of Marx, uh, it turns out that Marx actually didn't like Lisa Gare personally, or at least wasn't happy about the, re the relationship 
that his daughter had with Lisa Gare. So his daughter Eleanor was engaged with Lisa Gare. It called, caused all sorts of turmoil in the, the Marx family uh, and eventually the engagement ended in failure. Uh, you can probably pick this up in any biography of Karl Marx, but the, the one I got this from was Karl Marx, A Life by Francis Wien, a book I've reviewed separately on this channel. He goes into all the details about the intense drama that this engagement caused the Marx family. But putting that personal drama aside, uh, Marx approved of this history of the Paris Commune. Um, now the, the edition I got, which was a used copy, um, had a publisher's introduction that recommended that you read the, this book together with Karl Marx's The Civil War in France. Uh, the Civil War in France is Karl Marx's major writing on the Paris Commune. I've actually read The Civil War in France. Uh, again, I've reviewed it separately in this channel. Or I've reviewed it under the headings of uh, Marx's Political Writings, Volume 3. Um, and yeah, they're both interesting. I, I think I can safely say you don't need to read them together, or the, the reading of the one is not essential to the understanding of the other. But it is kind of neat to read them together, and I think if memory serves, I think I even noticed some of the same phrases popping up in both, which is, you know, again, probably because Karl Marx himself expanded the analytical section of the English edition. He probably just used some of the same phrases. What I, re re what I would recommend, uh, sorry, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble articulating today. Anyways, what I, what I, <clears throat> what I would recommend is that you do not read uh, Lisa Gare's work as an introduction to the Paris Commune. Uh, so in other words, if you've never read anything on the Paris Commune before, don't make this your first book. Uh, and the reason is, is he wrote this kind of right after the Paris Commune, like right when this was still hot news. Um, so it's written, it's meant to be read by a contemporary reader. Uh, it's not meant to be read by someone a couple hundred years later who's not really familiar with all the names and doesn't really know the politics and stuff like that. Uh, he, you know, he just kind of throws all these names at you and assumes that you know them because they were kind of current names at the time. Um, so read like, read like a general history of the Paris Commune that was written for a modern audience first and then go into this one for more detail. Um, Lisa Gare throughout, again, because this was written kind of right after the Paris Commune happened, kind of assumes that the reader is familiar with the events that, are, that happened, but they want a greater analysis. Um, the ideal reader of this book is already familiar with at least the basics of the Paris Commune and its place in history. Also, you probably want some knowledge of Paris geography because all these street names and places get thrown out at you. That being said, I know zero about Paris geography. I've never been to Paris, never been to France. And I was able to kind of struggle through anyways. I mean, like, I'm sure I would have appreciated it better if I knew where these streets were but you can still you can still like get the sense that stuff is happening somewhere even if you don't know where these streets are but it, it it's better if you know where the streets are uh, the ideal reader is also interested in both military and social history so there's a lot of military history here in that lisa gare spends a lot of time talking about the street fighting in detail like which barricades were up where, how did the barricades fall, how were the barricades defended. He spends a lot of time talking about the street fighting. So you need to be interested in that. But he also spends a lot of time talking about the politics of the, of the Paris Commune, like the internal 
uh, political debates in the government. So if you're not interested in both of those, uh, this book might be a struggle for you. If you're interested in both of those, uh, then this is the perfect book. It's not a light read. I struggled through it a bit. Uh, the prose is kind of heavy, again, maybe because it was, you know, written 150 years ago, so the style is kind of old. But if you're interested in this, I mean, don't go near this book if you're not interested in the Paris Commune. But if you are interested in the Paris Commune, this is a great book. There is so much detail in here. Um, and if you love the detail, uh, you're going to love this book. I mean, not he goes right into the thick of the street fighting around the barricades. He goes also right into the thick of the meetings of the Paris Commune government and what they were arguing about. Uh, and he even talks about the short-lived Communard uprisings that happened in the French provinces at the same time. Right, so when, when there was an uprising in, in Paris, uh, there was also several other uprisings that happened in provincial cities at the same time. Most histories of the Paris Commune you read, especially most modern histories, were kind of brush over these other uprisings. So, like they'll say, oh, by the way, uh, also there were some shortly lived uprisings in the province, but we're not going to focus on them. Uh, Lisa Gare actually focuses on them. Uh, it's the only history of the Paris Commune I've ever read that talks about, it, that talks in some detail about these uprisings that were also happening in the provinces. Um, now, Lisa Gare is not shy about trying to draw lessons from what happened in the Paris Commune. Uh, so the, the lessons are numerous and the book is just as heavy with analysis as it is with kind of the historical details. One of the interesting things, um, right from the beginning, like right from the first kind of few paragraphs, you learn that in Lisa Gare's vocabulary, uh, leftist and liberal are insults. Uh, even though like he's a Marxist, he, the people, the people he calls liberals and the people he calls leftists are not people he views as allies. So he, I guess he's coming from the Marxist perspective here where like the, the bourgeois left or the bourgeois liberals are not allies. Uh, and he names names. Uh, people who come in for kind of repeated criticisms are Leon Gambetta and Louis Blanc. Again, sorry for mispronouncing them. Um, Louis Blanc or Louis Blanc, I don't, uh, Louis and Blanc, B-L-A-N-C. He was actually the kind of main socialist leader of the 1848 revolutions, but he was not a supporter of the Paris Commune. So either he became more conservative as he got older, or I think as Lisa Gare and Marx are alleging, he was always kind of, uh, uh, he was always kind of not radical enough for them. Um, so they, yeah. And he, he, he was on the assembly in Versailles and he, he steadfastly refused to acknowledge the Paris Commune. Um, yeah, and Leon Gambetta was another one. He was a hero of the left, but uh, completely refused to support the Paris Commune. Uh, and Lisa Gare demonstrates again and again how they sat in the Versailles Assembly and even supported many of the atrocities against the Paris Commune that the Versailles Assembly uh, voted for. But uh, not only does the liberal left come in for criticism, Lisa Gare also criticizes the radicals. So like nobody gets off without criticism in this book. So obviously he's a supporter of the Paris Commune, but he's of the opinion that the leaders of the Paris Commune, including the radicals, completely bungled this. Uh, and he is not out 
to kind of enshrine the martyrs as revolutionary saints. He wants to show exactly where they bungled. Uh, and he, he makes this clear right from his introduction, where he writes, the child has the right to know the reason of the paternal defeats. The Socialist Party, the campaign of its flag in all countries. He who tells the people revolutionary legends, he who amuses them with sensational stories, is as criminal as the geographer who would draw up far, false charts for navigators. Now, everybody gets criticized a little bit, but some people get criticized a lot. Uh, two people get criticized a lot, and I again apologize, apologies for mispronouncing the names, Felix Piat and Gustav Kusseret. Uh, Felix Piat again was one of the leftover heroes from the 1848 revolution, uh, who was uh, again prominent in the Paris Commune. He is shown as a loudmouth who is more concerned with scoring points against his political rivals inside the Paris Commune than protecting the revolution against Versailles. Uh, sorry, Versailles. So Felix Piat was more concerned about this just point scoring against, sorry, I'm repeating myself. He, but he was more concerned about just showing off and giving speeches against the the people inside the Paris Commune than he was worried about the external threat. Um, and for what it's worth, the other histories I've read of the Paris Commune also seem to collaborate this view. Uh, Lisa Garay lays the blame for most of the division among the communards at the feet of Piat. At one point in the book, a number, another member of the Commune tells Piat, you are the evil genius of this revolution. Gustave Clusserat was at uh, one point in charge of the defense of the Paris Commune, and he is portrayed as being incredibly arrogant and criminally negligible. Uh, and uh, Lisa Gray personally blames him for many of the Versailles early victories. Uh, it's worth noting here as well that uh, Gustave Clusserat was um, one of the allies of Mikhail Bakunin, who was Marx's rival for control of the Working Men's International. And maybe that plays into how negative Clusseret's portrayal is in this book. But again, for what it's worth, uh, the other histories I've read of the Paris Commune also tend to have a negative view of Clusseret. Um, so, I don't know. Um, now, nobody gets off completely scot-free, but some of the members of the Paris Commune are treated with a fair degree of respect. Again, I'm going to mispronounce this name, but Charles de la Schultz, de la Schultz uh, emerges as one of the heroes of the Commune. Uh, he made some mistakes, um, but he, seemed to, he redeemed his mistakes with his heroic death on the barricades, and his heroic death on the barricades is reported with great reverence. Uh, apparently, this was even witnessed personally by Lisa Gare. Uh, the great tragedy of this book, at least from Lisa Gare's perspective, something he emphasizes again and again, is that the Paris Commune didn't actually have to fail. If the leaders had been better organized, if the com if the uprisings in the provinces had been better organized, uh, it could have succeeded. There was plenty of popular support. Uh, it just wasn't organized. The leaders squabbled with each other. Uh, the leftists betrayed the people. And then the radical leaders, uh, who the leaders of the Paris Commune uh, just ended up squabbling among themselves and being completely disorganized. I've read other reviewers say that this is essentially a, a Leninist view, or that the, the Leninists have kind of adopted Lisa Gare, uh, Lisa Gare's view, saying, 
the reason the Paris Commune failed is because nobody was willing to kind of take control and do what needed to be done. I personally um, have always sympathized more with the uh, anarchist wing of the socialist movement, which I guess makes me reluctant to endorse the Leninist view. But uh, Lisa Gari does kind of make a strong case for it in this book. I, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I, I've got some personal reservations, but he makes a strong case in this book. Now, the last third of the book though, is about the fall of the commune. Um, so it talks about the mass executions of the communards once the French government in Versailles took control of Paris again, the kangaroo trials of the survival, sur survivors, uh, and the fate of the exiles in New Caledonia. So the most... Uh, a large member, a large amount of the Paris Commune leaders were just executed. First in kind of mass shootings, then in kangaroo trials, which resulted in executions. Uh, and then those that survived all that were sent to New Caledonia. Uh, the vicious cruelty of the bourgeoisie uh, really...